All right, it's 2 p.m., so I guess I will begin. Welcome, everyone, to today's session, Reflections on a National Settlement Language Training Program. We'll link, look the same in five years from now. Our speaker today is Brenda Lawrence, and I will uh, provide a brief biography on her. Brenda is the Executive Director of LISTEN Language Instruction Support and Training Network, formerly ELSA.ELSANET and has been involved in this BC Provincial Settlement Language Umbrella Organization since 2000. In 2012, she was a founding member of the Citizenship and Immigration Canada Newcomer Language Ad Advisory Body and Lab, and now sits as the sector co-chair along with Yves Saint-Germain. She also is the current TESOL Canada Board Chair of the Settlement Language Network, a settlement language national network which supports outreach to individuals involved in settlement language programming across the country. For many years, Brenda's passion has been working with funders on settlement policy and programming, and it is her aim to support and facilitate the voice of language providers at various decision-making tables. There are some other NLAB participants in our group today. Maybe they could identify themselves by raising their hand in the function tab at the bottom of the attendee list. So if it's possible for the NLAB members to raise their hand to identify who is part of that committee along with Brenda. Great. So yeah, we have Briar, Karen, Anne, and Hannah hasn't yet raised her hand, but Hannah's also on NLAB. So um, I will certainly ask for their input um, during the course of this and um, hopefully you can also utilize the chat if there's any um, discussion items that come up. So probably what I'll aim to do is um, go through the slides fairly expediently because um, my hope here is to really draw and generate some discussion, some conversation. And also uh, sort, uh, sort of uh, challenge you to think about where will Link be in five years and, and uh, just thinking around some of the things that are coming up around policy and programming and how that might reflect on a national settlement language training program. Okay, so as Elena mentioned, um, I'm working with NLAB, which is the Newcomer Language Advisory Body, and we meet um, once a year uh, in Ottawa, but we also meet... Um, fairly regularly via uh, teleconference or other means just to uh, engage in conversation. And the Settlement Language National Network through TESOL Canada is just starting to uh, um, get pulled together and, and mobilized. So there will be more information coming out about that in the coming months. But that is another alternative in terms of engaging and um, hopefully reaching out to a number of you, <clears throat> excuse me, through a different venue. So I'll just dive right in. So avenues of engagement. Here's where we currently stand in terms of our ability to engage with um, government or others delivering programs um, for settlement language. The National Settlement Conference some of you may have participated in in November of 2013. And... Um, TESOL Canada, through the SLNN, actually did produce a paper in regards to that and submitted it to CIC. And uh, this was a primarily a stakeholder dialogue regarding Vision 2020. And some of you might say, well, what is Vision 2020? And I think it's, it's generally dis discussions that are happening at the Thunder table in terms of how we're moving forward and the types of immigration processes that we're um, looking at. So I'll get into that a little bit more um, in coming slides, but just to mention that Vision 2020 is not a clarified document. It's more a process. Regional and provincial consultations happened uh, this fall, and many of you might have taken um, advantage of that opportunity. It was uh, generally... Um, the, the organizing generally happened at settlement umbrella agencies provincially, so some of you may have been invited to participate. And that's another opportunity for us to bring information forward to CIC, particularly in regards to the upcoming CFP or call for proposals that's anticipated fairly soon. 
Um, Tesla Canada and affiliate conferences are another avenue of engagement, and many of you may recognize um, the Tesla Canada conference and upcoming. It's happening in October around Halloween at Lake Louise. So there will be opportunities to uh, have discussions. Um, generally, we also have a pre-conference uh, session, so uh, a little bit more time to really dive into some of the issues regarding settlement language. And then there's convening tables. I've already mentioned SLNN. There are currently two language umbrellas, um, LISTEN and MILO, uh, BC and Manitoba. So those are offer opportunities uh, for settlement language providers to discuss um, policy issues and other things related to delivery. Some of you might might be involved in things in your own province or even regional area or city where you gather together. So that's the opportunity for you to find out locally um, what's happening in programs. So the, the Newcomer Language Advisory Body, which I already alluded to, was established in uh, 2012. The composition is broadly representative of different regions of the country. We have members um, that also uh, work in FSL, so both official languages are represented. And subsectors include um, the listings here at the bottom. Um, so a broad cross-section of expertise is really what we're looking at when, when we're looking at the membership for this particular advisory, which was um, pulled together by CIC. So coming out of that, <clears throat> Excuse me. What are sort of the general areas that um, NLAB members have sort of risen uh, or are uh, um, brought forward um, along with the CIC and funding counterparts in looking at how to um, uh, how to put together a national settlement program um, that that has a broad uh, frame of reference and you'll notice that we've got some categories on the left, including program guidelines, outreach, changing client needs, future. So a lot of, you know, sort of very big picture things. And then um, some suggestion of activities that relate to uh, to those big picture items. And so it's, it's never easy to really uh, drill down and... Um, and get to the essence of what needs to happen in order to address some of the big picture ideas. And, and that's a good portion of what NLAP's time is spent doing. As experts in settlement language, often we're looking at how can we, um, how can we bring to the fore these issues and actually create areas of activity that will facilitate um, a national program. So curriculum is a one. Um, recently, NLAB talked a little bit further about workplace link and other considerations um, in, in terms of how are we pulling together a potential uh, uh, framework for a curriculum. Um, online considerations came into that and in, including other emerging discussions. Um, so it, it's a real in, uh, area of great interest. I think delivery standards in terms of consistency is important when you have a national program, but um, of course, the the other consistent caveat to that um, that comes up at the table is regional flexibility, and I think all of you will agree that um, depending where you're providing service, there needs to be some flexibility for clients and providers alike. So, so how can we manage this but still uh, provide a high standard of service? Assessment has been a recent um, discussion area. Uh, trying to coalesce all of the different means of assessment out there. Certainly, um, PBLA is, is uh, being introduced as a form of, of ongoing classroom assessment, but also it's the big picture regarding um, citizenship and access to placement assessment, etc. Performance measurement is leading into uh, 1617, where we're, we're going to do a broad um, uh, CIC is, is conducting a broad evaluation of the settlement programming so um, so really it's it's a very vital topic right now because it pertains to ongoing funding nationally and uh, so that makes it a really important um, uh, an important area of endeavor right now 
Moving into outreach and professionalism, we have uh, key sector structures and coordination. A lot of that is done through settlement umbrella organizations, but I think there's questions there about how we can better tap into information as language providers. <clears throat> Professional development is another area where we're looking at changes, um, such as more online formats, and uh, Realize is, is a cert certainly an example of that. So where are we heading around uh, our professional development endeavors? Changing client needs is a constant, <laughs> and eligibility, uh, citizenship criteria, for instance, um, access, uh, new mechanisms for bringing... Um, bringing clients into the country. Uh, I will um, come back to that a little bit later in my talk. And finally, in terms of shaping the future, use of technology pre and post arrival, and uh, also Francophone, and how do we engage with that particular group. So I will keep going here. So we did have... Um, the 2014 Integration Summit, as I mentioned. Some of you may have been involved. And uh, I'm just going to go a little bit into an overview of some of what came out of these integration summits. And really, this was an opportunity um, for us to inform CIC on the local level. And uh, I'd, I'd be curious to know how many of you actually uh, participated <laughs> in, in these summits. So I wonder if there's another opportunity to just use that icon uh, the raised hand icon on the side just to get a sense if uh, some of you were involved in the summits. So we've got a few people coming in with uh, with hands raised. That's great. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the positive side here is that it's, it's uh, an opportunity for us to engage. But the... Um, uh, the limitations come when uh, we're not invited to the table um, for the expertise that we bring forward and potentially we might be able to bring information um, to, uh, to uh, participants at the summit and, and sort of uh, in turn um, have a role to play in informing some of this information. But uh, that's the reason I'm uh, trying to do a bit of outreach around what kind of information came forward at the integration summits to see if if uh, we're missing something, for instance. Is there something else that um, that should have been alluded to that you're noticing is, is lacking in uh, what comes forward um, through the roll-up of these summits? So I'm, I'm really looking forward to a good discussion around this. So, uh, number one, language placement, assessment, and referrals. And I have arranged um, uh, the um, uh, topics, the broad topics, um, in a way uh, that CIC had originally introduced some broad frames of reference for moving into summit discussions. So, they are arranged um, from a citizenship and immigration Canada perspective initially, but of course the points coming out of, out of it. So the, the following points are the ones that were introduced, um, regionally. And I've, I've not made an attempt here to prioritize. So this is just referring to, um, some of the key comments that came up again and again at various provinces. And, uh, the, the full roll up, you'll find is one of the documents that I've included as a background for this session. So I've taken out a few of the key points, but please refer to that full fulsome document, um, the roll-up document, to get a little bit more of a sense of what came up in individual provinces. So um, certainly accommodating assessment mechanisms is important. I think that particularly... Um, Providers out of urban centers are finding that a challenge, and I know that there's um, there there are some mechanisms being looked at around that, but but there is still a definite need around uh, ensuring assessment mechanisms, um, particularly for citizenship applications, and that has arisen again and again. And I'm sure many of you um, can cite instances of access challenges in your areas. Local specific, um, cell PIP is another option for citizenship and that may or may not be accessible for some of uh, your clients. 
And then, of course, um, FSL assessment is another area entirely, but uh, that also came up as a point of interest. Language training and resources for basic social interactions. So we're looking roughly at uh, the lower level, CLBs, and um, some of the comments that came up were areas around support for more um, vulnerable groups like literacy, uh, refugees potentially facing issues of trauma, depression, and forced migration. CIC has recent, recently indicated um, bringing in about 10,000 Syrians in the next three years. So uh, we'll probably see um, a fairly large number of people coming in uh, with some kind of uh, um, issues around uh, trauma and, and, and these types of things. And how do we, in a language classroom, sort of facilitate uh, at least um, sensitivity around this? And a lot of us maybe do referrals to appropriate uh, resources in the community, but the more language uh, provider um, providers can understand how to sensitively address some of these topics, um, the better we'll be able to support those clients. Um, variety of delivery models and flexibility, of course, continues to be of uh, uh, strong interest. Use of technology um, as well as digital uh, literacy. So these kinds of areas are starting to gather momentum. Um, one of the uh, suggestions that came up fairly frequently in different provincial discussions is um, a hub model of services and some of you may be involved in in that kind of a service but um, how can we best support newcomers to access uh, these types of services um, in, in and facilitate that to happen okay a subcategory here is special populations and certainly youth and seniors came up fairly frequently um, I think uh, potentially it's been a long time um, consideration, but there hasn't really been dedicated uh, funding pot potentially for for these particular groups. Um, seamless and successful transition of youth is becoming more and more important with, uh, I think, um, in terms of government discussions around disenfranchised youth and ensuring that they're feeling uh, that they're integrating well. Um, so successful transition and all of that. Uh, certainly, I think that there's some dichotomy around the link um, programming um, and trying to ensure that youth are really getting what they need specifically. It's, it's not always an easy balance, but uh, I'm sure a lot of you are working out ways of making that happen. Um, same with seniors in terms of uh, trying to access specialized programming. So youth and seniors also become highlighted with the new citizenship uh, regulations coming in, which will encompass 14-year-olds to seniors at 65, when as previously it was 18-year-olds to 54. So suddenly we have another whole group here at both ends of the age spectrum that are going to be looking for uh, language verification with CLB, um, CLB uh, indications of, or, sorry, indications or verification of achieving CLB4 in listening and speaking. So uh, how do we facilitate that as well? Um, refugees, of course, I've already mentioned. Um, tools for teachers, potentially. And then uh, there's the whole idea of uh, the ineligibles, including temporary foreign workers, a group that, that really is um, a special population, but at this point unable to access uh, services. Now moving into language market uh, discussion and, and higher levels of CLB. So um, essential skills comes up under workplace link as do other uh, areas and intercultural communication, of course. When we're having discussions uh, at the NLAB table around national curriculum, the idea of where does workplace link fit into this and what components need to be considered uh, has been um, a really interesting discussion, and I think it, it bears more consideration. Um, there's also there was also a significant um, uh, a, a significant interest in sector specific language options. What what's out there for um, specialized 
uh, occupations, for instance, and, and how can we support those clients to actually um, facilitate them towards entering their profession of choice. Encouraging employer involvement was a suggestion around uh, training, offering training, mentorship, integration into workplace. So there's a whole area with express entry and that the new um, sort of uh, immigration category that I'm not going to get into right now. But, but uh, certainly labor market is a prime consideration when we're looking at express entry and how do we support that group. Newcomers with special needs, um, I'm not sure how many of your uh, areas of um, service actually do allow for this, but uh, we're looking at um, uh, special needs that include learning disabilities and testing of such maybe different modalities, modalities of instruction uh, could be important in that area. Um, mental health issues also came up, so um, there's probably a broader spectrum than I'm bringing forward at this point here, but, but uh, it, is, um, it is an interesting discussion on how we can better support this uh, subpopulation. And I can also attest that with new, um, with, with a, a broader perspective on, on bringing um, refugees into Canada, and that happened, I suppose, about three years ago now, uh, there, there was more consideration of bringing in people with higher needs, and that included medical needs and other um, types of potential impairments. So certainly uh, CIC has been trying to encompass a broader spectrum of uh, um, those needing uh, special uh, supports um, when looking at refugee support or, or uh, intake on refugees. So I think that we'll also see this kind of um, person coming into our classroom. And do we turn them away if we can't provide the, the need or, or do we facilitate ways of being able to um, support this? Now, uh, the next one here is newcomers destined to official language minority communities, which um, is uh, now sort of a... Um, a priority uh, support discussion happening at the National Settlement Council uh, level, which is the broad discussion um, on policy issues nationally that includes some sector reps in, in uh, discussing where to put uh, focus and priority. So the um, Francophone community we found perhaps wasn't as well represented as it could have been at the uh, discussions at the in integration summits, but some of the um, issues that did come up related to Francophone supports included more awareness, uh, meeting language and Francophone needs, informal services potentially, so just to mention a few. Now, other additional categories coming out of uh, provincial summits, so this was apart from what uh, CIC had sort of indicated as focus potential focus points um, included certainly remote communities and uh, although informal supports conversation classes and the like um, are possibly an alternative when you don't have critical mass for uh, a classroom format but still access to formal language training needs to be considered so it's it's definitely an ongoing consideration how do you ensure that regardless of where a newcomer chooses to land that they're still accessing um, some kind of supports in terms of language and other settlement goals contracting also came up fairly predominantly um, when I am alluding here to transitioning provinces, um, this is BC and Manitoba who transitioned from their own uh, provincial programming into the federal bracket of national link programming, um, although the dollars still came from the feds uh, for a number of years. BC and Manitoba were um, uh, using transfer dollars to provide services in their own um, provincial areas. So how can we allow for flexibility with those transitioning provinces? There are some best practices that are being brought in. And uh, I think um, consideration of, of how to make, uh, make that part of the overall spectrum of how we're delivering service is an important consideration. Certainly recognition of instructor time, and many of you will probably agree. Um, 
PBLA is one such example of where we're, we're uh, introducing more um, well, we're, we're introducing some perhaps complicated theoretical background for instructors, but also uh, um, giving them instruments in order to, you know, uh, support their clients in different ways. And I think that also heightens uh, demands of stru instructor time and, uh, and also expectations. And so how can we ensure that recognition um, of this is is understood and and uh, the contracting sort of reflects that uh, increased demand and also more variety in funded delivery models um, came up as a point of uh, as an, an important point in a lot of um, provincial discussions. Of course, childcare, transportation, um, access and availability came up time and again. And that uh, was reflected across the country. Um, some provinces more than others indicated provincial involvement needed to be stronger. I think um, depending on the province that you uh, work with, you might have a very strong and involved provincial team that's also providing ESL services. But in other areas, you might not uh, have the same amount of involvement. And, um, and of course, that's to the de detriment of... Um, of clients as well, particularly those that are no longer eligible for link services. So NLAB did have a response to the summit process, and these are some of the points we brought forward. Um, of course, the opportunity to, to network and discuss with stakeholders is uh, appreciated. But I think that because there was often not enough time to prioritize, um, there, there could be a proliferation of points and, and no clear target. And I think that um, that's why we suggested that CIC regional offices consider an array of inputs, including discussions such as the one we're having today. Um, there might have been fewer language experts uh, in certain jurisdictions giving input on language services, which can cause misunderstandings. Uh, certainly having frontline involved is helpful, and I'm not sure if that happened in your jurisdiction, but in some um, it, it did more so than others. And I've already alluded to the francophone representation. So areas of interest, and this is broader. Um, I'm also a representative from NLAB on uh, the National Settlement Council, which is the broad input table, policy table, that meets twice yearly in Ottawa. And some of the discussion elements at that table include a national survey of training gaps that some of you may have inputted in. Um, and I've provided a link in my TESOL Canada um, overview. So if, if you wanted to follow that up and, and look further at, at that information, uh, I've already mentioned the evaluation of the settlement program. And we need to tell the story of settlement language training. We need to ensure that uh, we're, we're indicating how does this really support newcomers to the country to ensure funding levels remain stable. And it's an important piece for us to consider. Pre-arrival services are currently awaiting CFP results. They have not been released yet. Uh, language services, uh, I think, were not highlighted in, in this uh, recent CFP. So that's still a question. How are we looking at domestic versus overseas in the continuum there? There's a national action plan helping immigrants succeed. And this is a federal, provincial, territorial discussion um, involving primarily labor market, but in other areas as well as including social connections to communities. So, you know, sort of a broader perspective. And Pan-Canadian Strategy on Vulnerable Populations is getting started. And uh, I've already alluded to the need to support um, vulnerable populations such as refugees. Okay, so here's my sort of one um, attempt at looking at, okay, five years from now, <laughs> what are we looking at? How, how is all of this sort of coming down to uh, the provider experience and what are we what are we looking at as a sector? And um, here I've, I've brought in a few examples uh, from what I've heard and what I've been hearing, um, but uh, you may have more to... Uh, to bring forward to this discussion. And so I'll just allude to uh, these few points. One of them is uh, learner demographics. Uh, higher functioning skilled immigrants 
uh, to lower functioning vulnerable populations. We're seeing a real dichotomy there um, with express entry. We'll see more higher functioning skilled immigrants coming in. And vulnerable populations allude often to refugee populations and others that come in uh, presenting challenges. A wider geographical distribution of clients. We're certainly seeing that in BC with uh, northern BC getting um, a substantial boost in terms of economy. And, and that's reflected in distribution of clients and needs for services. Integration technology is... Um, is certainly uh, mandated nationally, and uh, we're looking at needs and processes for that. So you might have already included that in your own list of uh, changes if, if that hasn't already happened. Um, immigration trends, impact of citizen language requirements. So uh, those are just a few more policy initiatives that will affect the trickle down into the classroom. So I'm moving now into... Uh, guided discussion. And sorry, I've not really paid any attention to the chat box at this point. I've sort of just uh, tried to focus on bringing up the main points of, uh, of discussion to give the, the context and overview. But I'm hoping maybe Elena can uh, pull out a few of the key things that may have come passed on on uh, the chat at the side. And um, the first question that I'd like to sort of get into is engaging the settlement language community. And I already alluded a little bit here to the fact that maybe in your own provincial uh, community, you were not necessarily at the table um, helping to determine priority issues for the upcoming CFP. Uh, and potentially maybe uh, somebody in your organization was at the table and were able to, to sort of bring forward points um, that you discussed internally. But how can we engage our community to ensure that this information gets passed on. Um, and this, this is the outreach component. But anyway, I, I'll just um, let Elena first uh, come back to uh, just tying up anything that came out through the, um, the chat box. Uh, well, I'll try my best. There were a few themes that emerged in chat. I think the first of which was a uh, discussion around CLB competencies for, for citizenship applications. And cascading from that was some discussion around CLB requirements for immigration versus citizenship, CLB uh, requirements for young learners, so 14-year-olds versus adult learners, and the impact that has on the CLB, whether or not that document being drafted for an adult learner, if that would impact its use for teenagers. Um, so is there anything you wanted to draw from the discussion of um, CLB references that were made earlier in your talk? Um, assessment, citizenship requirements, etc. Well, first I'll check. Um, I'm not sure. I, I guess Briar, Briar has her ability to, Anne might be able to speak as well, I'm not sure. Um, if if anybody from uh, the NLAB group wants to sort of chime in at this point, um, feel free to do so. I don't know, Anne, did you want to say anything? Okay, I'll keep going then. Briar? Sure, I always have something to chime in, Brenda. Okay. We were talking about the CLB levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the discussion that was happening in the side chat, and I'm sorry, I kind of got lost because it was going quite quickly. There seemed to be some discussion about the applications for um, people that were applying to immigrate to Canada and then the CLB levels um, yeah. for citizenship. Um, so I think the understanding was that it's kind of like CLB 6 needs to be for the applications or higher. And yeah, Anna's with trying it. to connect yeah. through Yeah, the with express audio. entry. Oh, okay. Anna's trying to connect. That's great. And you can always, uh, Anne says she thinks she's muted. Can you potentially unmute her, Elena? Anne Senior? Because she's oh, from the CCLB. There she is. I got her. <laughs> okay. Anne, do you want to speak to this? 
Uh, certainly, the CLBs were developed for an adult immigrant population. So the, the big discussion we're currently having with CIC is uh, what correlation could be done? Um, how do they reflect the, the different uh, needs of, of the adult population? So CIC is thinking about this. The decision to put the age of 40 was, was a quick one. And so they, they're sort of jumping a little bit late to look at this. Uh, I've looked at, I, mean, I noticed the reference to the Alberta curriculum, which is fabulous, but in my mind is, and I think is referenced to the common European framework of reference, as is the Ontario curriculum for that age group. Definitely it's something that's been looked at. The other discussions that I saw going past were on the CLB levels for citizenship. In the regulations, it is definitively CLB4, which of course means completed. And so um, currently there is no CLB-based test that is rigorous enough for that level, which has been why the, the emphasis has been on classroom programs. Um, I sort of, someone saw the fact that we, you said in your presentation, the CLB6, that's not for a change in level, that is that one of the funders has suggested that if the current tests are not rigorous enough at CLB4, then if we made it, that jump to CLB6, then we'd be covered off. So that's where we're going on that. Yeah, I think I alluded that to that um, earlier in a slide. Uh, one of the provincial uh, discussions at the Integration Summit was allowing a CLB6 confirmed uh, placement um, assessment to uh, to also meet the citizenship requirements. So that's what Anne is alluding to. So, uh, yeah, I think it remains to be seen. I don't know that school boards across the country are even aware of this coming change that I understand is happening in May of this year. So uh, whether there will be more um, uh, supports put forward, certainly uh, a high school diploma, a Canadian high school diploma, is considering, considered as meeting the requirements. So at the very least, uh, those students that are 14 may have to wait until they graduate uh, at this point in time um, when, when the regulations come in until there, there is more understanding of how they can actually um, access testing. So uh, keep in mind that, of course, with express entry, there are higher levels of um, proved language ability at point of uh, entry, but it's, it's also family members that we're looking at. So that's a broader category. Um, primary ap applicants are different from um, spouses and others that, uh, that enter with them. So there's continuing question here on how uh, those uh, citizenship needs will be met. So we, I'm not sure if we covered that adequately. I'll just see if there's something else that has come up. There was also a discussion around involvement in decision making for programs and funding. So who's actually at the table for those discussions? That's something that came up in a few of the comments that were raised by attendees as well. Um, okay, so the, the platforms for discussion on policy and programming um, in CIC at, at the, uh, the, the national level right now, as I mentioned, are NLAB, which is the Newcomer Language Advisory Body, and uh, we do have a few representatives here um, on that group. So that was a group made up not of representation, particularly. It's more made up of, of expertise. However, um, there is a mind towards encompassing uh, uh, enough expertise from different areas of the country that we are, in fact, uh, able to bring forward information from um, uh, a broad geographical range of um, programming. So it's the, these uh, people that are sitting at the Newcomer Language Advisory Body table are brought on board more for their, um, their degree of expertise in certain areas of programming. The National Settlement Council, on the other hand, does um, 
facilitate representation through settlement umbrella agencies or organizations in your province. So there are people at the table that come on behalf of settlement umbrella organizations trying to meet a representational aspect of, of bringing forward information. And at that table, there's also four um, people from the Newcomer Language Advisory Body that input on behalf of language and beha on behalf of NLAB. So those are really the two um, key uh, areas of, of consistent input. But, but uh, as I mentioned, there's other informal areas of input. And your TESOL affiliate, for instance, could be an opportunity to bring forward information. The, the Settlement Language National Network through TESOL Canada could be another avenue to bring information forward. The, the TESOL conferences or affiliate conferences also have um, sessions such as this one um, often that, that facilitate uh, discussion and the ability to bring information forward. So I'm not sure if that answers the question adequately, but, but uh, that's sort of my response. Well, I, I do think what was raised was whether or not language professionals were involved and to what extent they were involved. And speaking to, to that with regards to the feedback that the committees take to CIC, um, uh, Hannah asks, do you want to probe feedback on key CIC priorities like the national curriculum uh, or a national curriculum? Um, and other con other concerns such as a le learning management system or a national framework. So to what extent is CIC receiving and um, reviewing the feedback provided? Well, this is where sector coordination comes in, and it's not as well established with the language groups as it is with uh, settlement umbrella organizations. In BC, we do have um, an established uh, sector coordination through LISTEN, uh, the organization that uh, I work with. And there we have um, regional tables that input into pro provincial tables that input into funder dialogues. And, you know, we have a fairly strong mechanism um, in, in BC that, that uh, we've had over the years under our provincial government funded um, uh, process. So, uh, so I think it varies on region in terms of where is your sector coordination, where is it held, and and if it isn't, um, how do we address that gap? How can we uh, better engage? And is is your provincial affiliate, um, uh, TESOL affiliate, for, for instance, um, a potential... Uh, um, a potential um, avenue for engagement? I'm not sure. I mean, in some provinces, maybe more so than others. Can we facilitate that? Uh, potentially, that's that's an opportunity to be looked at. So I'd like to encourage you to try and look at opportunities for engagement. Um, in terms of very specific areas of engagement, um, again, I think... Uh, if you want to uh, give feedback on things like um, the curriculum, uh, one, I, there isn't anything, um, any clear mechanism for very specific topics. However, the SLNN out of TESOL Canada is um, an opportunity. So uh, that's the Settlement Language National Network. Um, that's trying to provide some sort of outreach and sector coordination. And uh, you can join that platform through slnn at tessel.ca. So that's one avenue. All right. Okay. Thank you. I think for, for time purposes, maybe we can move on to the next question, Brenda. So, uh, yeah, um, this is looking at the priorities. And I know that I have not... Um, even in, in the more fulsome roll-up that, that uh, was provided um, as a document um, along with this session. Uh, I, I have not indicated by province, although you will see some geographical markers in there and, and sort of determine um, uh, some areas of your province, uh, you know, sort of um, being integrated. I'm just wondering overall, uh, is there something that you feel could be added? Uh, 
So there's um, a comment that it looks... Oh, Briar, let me just answer this first. Briar asked me, is it SSLN? No, it's um, SLNN, Settlement Language National Network, at tessel.ca, at tessel.ca. So um, I'll just clarify that first. Um, Michelle mentions that the document looks quite comprehensive. There's something here about assessors being calibrated. I, Anne might be able to uh, remark further um, to that. Okay. And yeah, am I um, muted again? Can you well, hear me? Well, it says here. Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Yeah, no, the, the placement tests, according to both the CLBA and the CLBPT, according to the test developers, was always understanding that the test taker had completed most of the descriptors. So there's always that question mark about most. In the original CLBPT document, it said 70%. So definitely it has always been the majority of the descriptors were completed, although the developers always say it's a snapshot on that day when the test has been taken. There's also a question here, and Susan mentions assessors should be calibrated annually. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, calibration is really, really important and should happen, whether it be annually or every second year. But the there used to be funding for link program calibration under CIC, and right now that's not happening. Yeah, that's right. CIC no longer funds that mm -hmm. yeah. calibration, my understanding anyway. And and also um, the training to become assessor. Uh, yeah, the yeah. training um, is also not funded. Okay. So there's a bit here on assessment. Okay, um, Michelle's also bringing up comments coming out of Manitoba about the importance of continued work with youth in the K-12 system. I think with the change in uh, in citizenship requirements, the K-12 system is, of course, involved and needs to be more uh, incorporated into the discussion. Although I think um, probably you're aware of the Swiss workers that, that are... Uh, at least involved in some amount of supports in the school system and therefore may be able to uh, facilitate a little bit more information coming to schools. Um, in BC, it works a little differently in that Swiss are actually um, not in all locations, but in many locations are actually uh, located in the school boards. And so they're school board employees, which allows for uh, the ability to really um, have uh, school board uh, facilitated discussion um, around what's happening. Um, and I think it's a little bit easier to to bring policy challenges in that environment where, where the discussion is in-house. But um, potentially there are opportunities with Swiss workers um, that are working out of um, immigration or sorry, settlement agencies that could also start helping to facilitate information about citizenship uh, with school boards. Although, really, what ha what needs to happen here is uh, policy discussion at the national level. <laughs> um, so, Swiss, yeah, settlement workers in schools is is uh, what I'm referring to as Swiss workers. Well, that's interesting. Some school districts are quite protective. Um, but I think, uh, you know, that they will want to be informed of... Uh, um, okay, I'm not sure where that... Is everybody hearing the same thing? <laughs> um, okay, anyway, I'll keep going. So uh, I, I think that school districts, um, because they're not uh, nationally um, driven, in terms of policy issues, they they are provincially. Uh, there needs to be more work um, facilitated between federal, provincial, territorial tables to ensure that adequate information is coming down to the school board level. If if it's not going to happen through current um, settlement initiatives in terms of supports to uh, citizenship, there has to be awareness. 
And as Michelle says, the impact's going to be at the classroom level. Um, certainly that's true. Okay, Bula's asking about um, PBLA. I know that that's, this has been a long-term, um, well, in terms of planning, it's been a long time coming, and, and there's been a lot of uh, sort of um, phasing in of the process of PBLA, and I think that continues to develop. So uh, the ongoing orientation of PBLA, I think, um, is also a discussion that's happening right now. Um, I don't have any clarity around around how that's going to be facilitated in coming years, but certainly there is expectation through contracting that administratively your school, once trained, should be able to carry out PBLA standards um, uh, in, in the format that was uh, um, taught by regional coaches. So that means there is a degree of um, administrative expectation around this process. And I think the more that we bring this back to our individual settlement officers, um, the more it'll stay on the table. We have to keep asking these questions. Is there a plan? What can we do? How can we ensure that we maintain the standard in our organization? If our lead teacher quits, you know, how can, how can we support the process and ensure that our organization remains um, up to date in these, uh, in this area? Okay. Um, so I'm not sure where to focus. We've got well, a few given, different threads given happening. The, given the time uh, restrictions we have, uh, Brenda, did you want to move on to the next question and then maybe invite everyone for questions in the Tutela group? Yeah, uh, Catherine's mentioning about the SLN info on tesla.ca, and I agree. Um, they were taken. We had a sig significant number of attachments and uh, documents posted on Tesla Canada. Um, there was a changeover in executive, and I think there's new processes in terms of how they're placing documents on Tesla. Um, to date, I, I'm still seeking approval for certain documents to be posted, and so hopefully that'll come soon. Um, at, at the current time, however, my Tesla Canada document uh, reference, refer, references links on my own uh, organization's website. And um, once we get uh, some of these documents up on Tesla Canada, that will be changed. But at this point, we're still looking at working with Tesla Canada to ensure relevant documents are put back up. So um, this comes, uh, number three is sort of looking at uh, where will Link be in five years? Again, an allusion to what are the trends and what's happening and uh, what mechanisms are we going to have to look at down the line to ensure um, that things are moving forward uh, in support of clients and not just reactive, but proactive. <laughs> so Colleen's mentioning, uh, oh, here we've got some... Um, supports for PBLA. I know Colleen's one of the uh, um, one of the regional trainers. So uh, a module plan bank, authentic materials, resources, supports for PBLA. That's great. Um, Teresa's talking about, okay, I think that's again um, referring back to PD and support potentially for PD, PBLA. Um, Karen, uh, on question three, that's great. We need a consistent tool and training and placement assessment, uh, as there are many variations in tools and supports. And, and that's probably um, a primary thing. You know, when you're, when you're providing uh, a national program, um, placement assessment become it, it's the consistency in placement uh, assessment becomes um, absolutely mandatory, uh, because that that is the starting point of the whole process. And so that's a really important uh, point. Michelle's mentioning bridging programs. Sustainability. Um, I think that uh, comment around sustainability is, um, is to do with the PBLA and ensuring certain standards are maintained. It's a lot of um, expectations and, uh, uh, you know, particularly when, uh, as I understand it, PBLA will also be a mechanism for teachers to approve 
uh, speaking, listening, for, for instance, speaking, listening, um, for, which again will have implications for citizenship. So it's suddenly a high stakes environment for teachers, right? Um, if we're determining citizenship for, for students, it's a high stakes environment. And so there needs to be consistent, um, opportunity to ensure that, uh, that uh, instructors are supported to be able to do that. Um, okay. Rigorous bridging programs that integrate and blend. Um, and bridging programs may not all be, um, in the funding pocket of the federal government, right? When we're looking at bridging programs, how are we also looking at our ES programming and, and how is the provincial system supporting that bridging into, uh, to, uh, skills training or other very specific, uh, professional development for, uh, newcomers. So I think we're looking at a broad spectrum here. And, uh, I know that, um, in recent discussions at NLAB, there has been discussion around broader frameworks inclusive of provincial systems. So how can we ensure that we're integrating, you know, uh, an ESL system that really, um, has a strong, uh, and facilitated, um, steps for, for those clients that need ESL after citizenship. Okay. PBLA is continuing here. Other new trends. I think one of the new trends that's coming out of this is the expectation on instructors. That's what I'm reading into this. Okay. Colleen's also talking about outreach and connection with the employment sector, trades training, skills training, and certainly that has strong volition at the uh, government tables. And so there's bound to be um, uh, a push in that direction. Um, we're looking at filling those trade needs and other employment um, gaps that we might be seeing nationally. Um, research is always helpful. <laughs> I will underline that because research can sometimes set the ball in motion for other things to happen. So, um, yeah, any of you out there sort of geared towards a research uh, way of, of um, uh, a research angle, PBLA might, might give a real source of information. And, and I think the question remains around how PBLA increases the higher stakes in the classroom. Okay, connection between skills competencies and language competencies. I think, um, you know, Jason Kinney now being um, at Human Resources and sort of that connection now with the employment side of things happening nationally uh, between CIC and, and uh, you know, uh, Human Resources um, is really an important one to take note of. Ka uh, Karen McNeil is talking about technology and certainly... That um, the investment in technology needs to happen, and I I think you know we we uh, jump too quickly into I don't know I I know that there was discussion around um, a broader um, uh, language management system, for instance, at the uh, initial. Um, introduction from CIC on Friday from Yves Saint-Germain. And I think, you know, you're looking at learn, um, uh, learning management systems and sort of the technology required behind it. We really have to ensure that we're looking for something that can feel, facilitate future direction <laughs> and not limitation. So um, I think it's, it's a challenging area that needs continued discussion. Okay, um, I'm seeing something would, here. Sorry, go ahead. If, if this could be our last question, Brenda, it certainly does need additional discussion, but we've come to the end of today's session. Um, oh. As I've noted on Twitter, the chat box was on fire, so there are a lot of um, discussions circulating around different themes. So if we can conclude today's session, that would be great. Okay, well, I mean, I think we all have our own successes and um Potentially, uh, over the past three years, um, we've looked at some successes and we've looked at some um, significant changes in the sector. But um, I will leave you with the question of what will the link look like in five years? 
And, and I think that's the question that we need to bring to our CFPs as we start to consider. I mean, potentially there is something happening in the spring around a call for proposals. I'm not sure, um, with, with pending elections and everything else, how that's all going to, um, sort itself out. But uh, I, I'd really like to encourage you to think on a policy level when you're looking at a programming level. Thank you very much, Brenda. Thank you, everyone, for a wonderful session and all of your excellent contributions in the chat. Everyone is welcome to head to Tutela if you want to continue the discussion there with your questions, um, pose them and we'll take the chat box back to Brenda, and she'll have access to all of your comments and questions after the yeah, session. Yeah, and, and I will certainly bring this back to our national committee um, for for more consideration. And, and uh, please join us at Lake Louise in October. <laughs> And uh, I think we'll try and have a full day discussion uh, related to some of these issues. And again, looking for feedback and, and input from any of you interested. And uh, uh, the Tesla Canada SLN and then committee is another avenue. So um, SLNN at Tesla.ca. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you.